with Eva Point Church for today's message on August 4th, 2024. Today, we will be continuing our parable series. Also, today's the first Sunday of the month, so we will be celebrating communion. So gather your elements, some bread or a cracker or something to drink, and we will celebrate it together after the message. Make sure you download our free app. It's available on Google or Apple. The very best way to keep up with all things Pivot Point comment on whatever platform you're watching so we know you're here. If you would, fill out that connect card on our website or app because we would love to hear from you. Don't forget to listen to today's worship music playlist, which can be found on our YouTube channel and on Spotify. The links can be found on our app or our website. Please like and share our posts and videos so others can find us because word of mouth is the best advertising there is and you can help us simply by sharing our videos and posts. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our messages. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us today to be with us. We ask that you guide us and keep us, help us to do all that you've asked us to do. Open our hearts and minds, Lord, to be receptive to your word today. Help us, though, not just be hearers of your word, Lord, but be doers. This is a hard lesson today, and I pray that you give us each the ability to internalize it and to do what you called us to do in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had someone hurt you so badly that you couldn't forgive them? Or maybe you tried and you failed to truly forgive them for whatever they did? No, Peter seems to have had a similar problem because he came to the Lord, he asked about this. Let's open your Bibles to Matthew 18. We're starting 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. All right, we must look at this, though, from the ancient Jewish perspective rather than our Western understanding. At this time, Jewish rabbis taught that one should only forgive another up to three times. So Peter must have thought he was doing well because he had doubled what the rabbis taught and added one just for good measure. We, we do that today, don't we? We think about that this is a standard, and I'm a Christian, so I'm, I'll do better. But no matter how much better we try to do, it's never enough <laughs> because Jesus is the only one that can make it. So Peter is here. He's trying to reduce forgiveness from mercy down to just basic mathematics. In response to this, Jesus confronts Peter with the truth that the, the spirit of forgiveness really knows no boundaries. Now, there is some confusion in translating 70 times 7 because some suggest it should just be rendered as 77 times. Now, this phrase is a typically graphic Jewish way of saying, never hold grudges. Nevertheless, it, it's not a problem of counting or mathematics, but it's truly a problem of the heart. In order to illustrate this point, Jesus tells a parable of the unmerciful servant. Now, we're going to continue reading in chapter 18 of Matthew. We're starting in 23 now. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owned him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled his debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. 
You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Oh, I love this parable. If there's ever someone who got what they deserved, it's that unmerciful servant. He owed a debt of 10,000 talents with a talent equaling about 6,000 denarii a day's wage or give or take. So the sum of his debt was about 6 million denarii. And a talent was about 130 pounds of silver equal to about 15 years of a laborer's wages. Uh, well, if you do the math, it means the servant owed the king or the, the master 150,000 years of labor that he definitely couldn't pay. Now, there are different figures that are given as how much is it equal today, but I've seen it estimated it's about $10 million. I'm not sure I'd make that much in a lifetime. I've been working for most of my life and I'm not even close. Because this debt is unimaginable. In other words, he would never, ever be able to pay him back. But then the king forgives this enormous, unimaginable debt. Well, many of us are today are in debt, so we have a small inkling as to how this man felt. I want you to imagine if all your debt had been wiped away in one motion. Your mortgage, your car payments, your credit cards, your medical debt, your student loans, all gone, paid in full. Imagine how that would feel. Uh, it's hard to imagine because debt is so pervasive in our society that here's a man who is so burdened that, by debt that it would take him 150 years to pay it. Now, those of us who have student loans might be able to relate. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be just a little bit relieved if, if all of that was wiped out? Maybe even a little overjoyed? You think maybe you'd want to pass it on? Oh, but not this guy, though. After being forgiven 150,000 years of labor, someone else owes him about 100 days of labor. And he has him arrested and thrown in jail. When the king, or the master, who had forgiven him so much heard about this, he had this guy tortured until he could pay his entire debt. Isn't that delicious? Yeah, we think it's good karma, right? Wrong. Oh, the weeping, the gnashing of teeth. Oh, the justice. He deserves it, didn't he? Oh, wait. Then these words of Jesus haunt me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Uh-oh. That unmerciful servant is me. I've been shown so much mercy, so much mercy. More mercy, in fact, than I'm comfortable going into the details about. So who am I to judge another? Why can't I have mercy on the guy who owes me? That's what this passage is about, mercy. Mercy is about not getting what we do deserve. This is extravagant, ridiculous, over-the-top mercy. We don't get what we deserve, which is death and separation from God, and yet he gives us mercy. Not just the undeserving, but especially the undeserving. I mean, mercy wouldn't be mercy if it were earned. It's so easy to want to jump all, all over one another in this life. It's easy to claim the higher ground and proclaim that I'm better than someone else. But that's not the way of Jesus. Now, admittedly, in this story, it's specifically about forgiving our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
But we can't deny that Jesus, and the rest of the New Testament for that matter, calls for mercy and forgiveness for all people, especially those who strike us on the cheek and demand our cloak. How often should I forgive, Peter asked. And that's what started this whole thing off. And Jesus' response doesn't so much as provide a precise answer as much as it points out how misdirected the question itself is. How many times should we forgive? The issue isn't about how much or how often we're asked to forgive or whether we should forgive. And this is because Forgiveness in Christ is already limitless. It can't be measured or counted out. It is just part and parcel of what the kingdom of God is all about. It's a constant. It doesn't stop at a certain number of offenses. Now, we may want it to, and that is at the heart of Peter's question. At what point is it okay to exact punishment on those who have wronged me? Do I have to keep forgiving them, even though they keep doing that thing? How much is enough, is what Peter's asking. I, I think I'm being pretty lenient, he thinks. If I forgive someone seven times, surely that's enough. Uh, but Jesus said, not seven times, but 77 times. Which, remember, seven is the number of completeness. That means every time, continuously, no matter how many times it takes. Ooh, that sure can be hard to hear because, after all, how can we possibly bring ourselves to endlessly forgive? Well, let's face this. Forgiveness truly has to be one of the most difficult things for a human to do. Not only to, to give forgiveness, but to receive it. And for Jesus to tell the parable he tells in our gospel lesson indicates that forgiveness is extremely important for us and for God. It's a necessity. It is what Christ followers must aim to do and do and do. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man who knew a lot about forgiveness. He said, forgiveness is not just an occasional act. It's a constant attitude. C.S. Lewis said to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Now remember, we're told in Romans 3.23 that we all have sin. And then in Romans 6.23, he says sin's wages is death. Now, we're making a little sense, are we not? We are the receivers of God's amazing grace, the grace that cost the Son of God his life on the cross. And if we accept this grace, if we truly have received God's forgiveness, we must practice amazing grace with others. I heard a story about a Turkish officer who had raided and looted an Armenian home he killed the parents and gave the daughters to the soldiers, keeping the oldest daughter for himself. Sometime later, she escaped and became a nurse. Some time passed, and she found herself working in a ward filled with Tur Turkish officers. One night, by the light of a lantern, she saw the face of the officer. He was so ill that without a lot of hard work on her part, he would die. And so the days passed and he recovered. One day the doctor stood by the bed with her and said to the officer, if it weren't for her devotion to you, you would be dead. He looked at her and said, we have met before, haven't we? Yes, she said, we have met before. Why didn't you kill me, he asked. She replied, I am a follower of him who said, love your enemies. Forgiveness and love are two sides of the same coin, are they not? They're intertwined. They recreate us into the image of God. <laughs> but if you're like me, you sometimes find it hard to forgive. You take things personally and hold on to those resentments. 
There are some folks who have hurt you too much, so much that you just can't bring yourself to forgive them. Someone once said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have to forgive. I've heard that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other guy to die. Sometimes the person it's hardest to forgive though, isn't one of them, it's ourselves. Do you have that problem? Do you have anything in your life that you don't think God could ever forgive you for? And are you allowing that inability to be forgiven or to forgive? to cut you off from fellowship with Jesus Christ and his body, the church? Jesus is teaching us that forgiveness must become a practice, a commitment that is kept up and renewed each day throughout our lives. It's not just one single action, feeling, or thought, because forgiveness must become a way of life. For all of us in our ever-deepening friendship with God, with other people. Peter is asking how generous he should be with forgiving, but he's still asking about limits. He's thinking quantitatively, while Jesus answers qualitatively with the offer of unlimited forgiveness. This is what God is like. It is only because we have been abundantly and mercifully forgiven and loved by God that we're even able to forgive others. Now, when I think about it, when, when I really meditate on my life and some of the things I've done, said, and thought, when I think of all the people I have hurt, all the hateful words that have come out of my mouth and out of my heart, when I think about all the times I've let God down, and then when I think about how much God loves me and despite all of that, well, it, it kind of blows my mind. When I know that I am forgiven through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, how can I not do but forgive others who do something against me? Now, the point is, so shall my heavenly Father also do to you. If each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Ooh, that's Matthew 18, 35. It's the last verse of our reading. This is so consistent with what Jesus was teaching back in Matthew 6, in which he stated that God will not forgive us if we do not forgive others. Eh, we don't forgive in order to be forgiven. We have to remember that. We forgive because we have been forgiven. Yet if we fail to forgive, uh, then, then there's a catch 22 in there that we will not be forgiven. So this parable, the unforgiving servant, which follows Peter's question to Jesus, focuses on those of us who are willing to receive God's forgiveness, but are un unwilling or unable to offer it to others. I mean, the servant has been forgiven a huge debt and yet is unwilling to forgive even a small debt owed to him. It, it's like accepting that God forgives me for all the wrongs I have done through my entire life and then being unwilling to forgive someone who hurts my feelings. And the parable is telling us that such an unwillingness to forgive shows that the unmerciful servant is really not able to receive God's forgiveness. Because to truly receive forgiveness is to recognize how extravagant God's gracious forgiving love is. And in response to, we need to offer it to others. But you know, again, if, if I'm honest, there are times when I find myself behaving like that unforgiving servant. How about you? I mean, are you pleased with the idea of a forgiving God, but not if it requires that you have to change your life? Now, to be forgiven and to forgive is, is really hard stuff. It does take some time and, and a little bit of struggle. There's a book called Dead Man Walking, and it tells the story of Lloyd LeBlanc, whose son was murdered. 
when he arrived in the field with the sheriff's deputies to identify his son LeBlanc. Immediately, he knelt by his boy's body and prayed the Lord's Prayer. When it came to the words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, he realized the depth of the commitment he was making. Whoever did this, I must forgive them, he later said. Though it has been difficult not to be overcome by bitterness and feelings of revenge that welled up from time to time, LeBlanc said that each day, for the rest of his life, forgiveness must be prayed for and struggled for and won. I can't imagine how hard it is to forgive someone who killed your child. We are faced with, most of us, things that are far less important or far less difficult than the murder of our loved ones. And yet we struggle to forgive. As Christians, we're people who know what it means to discover the miracle of God's forgiveness. We're thus committed to a way of life as forgiving and forgiving people. Well, you know, to forgive someone is to set them free. And to be forgiven is to be set free. Have you ever really, really hurt someone and then felt horrible about it? And then gone begging for their forgiveness? And when they forgive you, do you not experience an amazing grace? That's what God does for us. That's what we are supposed to offer others. God's amazing grace. Forgiveness, like love, cannot be commanded or forced, but we can pray for it. For the ability to forgive those, well, alive or dead, who've hurt us. Even if we've distanced ourselves from them for good reason. And we can pray that we can forgive ourselves for some of our own sins and regrets. We can also pray for the ability to accept the forgiveness of others. And more importantly, to accept the forgiveness of God. So let's all take a minute or two to call to mind one person, or maybe several persons, that we're having a hard time forgiving. Let us confess our unforgiveness and ask the God of forgiveness to flow through us, freeing us and those whom we hold in contempt. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.32, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. We thank you so much for being here. And I want you to think about it. Forgiveness. It's a good thing. We're now going to be celebrating communion. So I hope you've had time to collect your elements, some bread and something to drink. Let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. At this table, we're reminded of a God whose grace never wearies, whose love never fails. We are reminded of a God who provides for every need, the needs of our bodies and the needs of our souls, who fed tens of thousands with manna and 5,000 with a small boy's lunch, and who brought to life the withered souls through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Scripture reminds us that this feast is a foretaste of a feast we will all share together in the kingdom of God. At the feast, they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south, and they will sit at the kingdom of God. Because in God's kingdom, none of the things that separates us shall continue to do so. This table is not my table. It is not Pivot Point Church's table. It is Christ's table. So it is not limited to those of a specific nationality, race, gender, or political identity. This table belongs to the God who reconciles us to one another and welcomes the hungry to partake in the feast which God has prepared. So I invite you to come, you who are broken and you who are whole. Come, you who have failed and you who are faithful. Come, regardless of your race, your sexuality, your gender, your nationality, 
or your social status because this table is for you and it is Christ who invites you. It is Christ who has made the way for you. If you feel Christ is calling you to this table, you're welcome. The table is prepared. Let us also prepare our hearts. Let's pray. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, at the beginning of time, your spirit moved upon the waters of chaos as you called forth land and sea, mountain and valley, desert and tundra, jungle and grassy plain. Your spirit went before Moses and the Hebrew children, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, leading them through the wilderness. Your spirit roused the hearts of the prophets who proclaimed your judgment upon the nations and called for your repentance among your people. For these mighty acts of your Holy Spirit and for your son, Jesus Christ, we praise your name. By your spirit, you anointed him to bring good news to the poor and to proclaim release to the captives. By your spirit, Jesus confronted the demons of oppression. In your spirit, he rejoiced as his disciples did great work in his name. At his death on the cross, Jesus yielded up his spirit to you, and by the Holy Spirit, you raised him from the dead. This same enlightening, empowering, enlivening spirit, Jesus promised to all who keep his commandment to love as he has loved. In remembrance of the mighty acts and blessed promises of Jesus, we offer ourselves to you in union with his offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here out of love for you and on this bread and wine. Let the bread we break be true fellowship in the body of Christ. Let the cup we share be true participation of the new covenant in his blood. By your spirit manifest in us the power of your redeeming love that we might may be Christ for this world, serving in his name. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, we pray together using the words taught to us. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Now on the night of his arrest, Jesus came to the table with those he loved and he took his bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and sharing it with his disciples, he said, take and drink this is a new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So now every time we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. Pray one more time. Lord, I want to forgive from the heart. This is a grace we pray for. We can't do it on our own, and we know it. Often we are unmerciful servants, but you are always good to us. Have mercy on us. Give us your forgiveness. Give us the ability and desire to forgive as graciously as you have forgiven us. Change our hearts, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching today. This week I hope that you are gracious with your forgiveness and that you can find a way to be a blessing to someone else. See you next time.
Join us on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. for our Zoom Bible study. We are going to study the Book of Romans. There are 24 sessions so it will be almost Christmas before we finish. I hope you can join us. The link can be found on our website or app. If you would like to do the study, but cannot join us on Tuesdays, please email Pastor Ruth at pastor.ruthking at yahoo.com and she will help you do the study on your own. Just like the first century church that met in homes, our Bob groups do too. Bob stands for Body of Believers and we hope that everyone will either join or host a Bob group. This is a great way to build relationships and grow your faith. All you have to do is invite your friends, family, neighbors, and co-workers to join you for a meal or potluck once or twice a week. While you are gathered, listen or watch our message, our worship playlist, and or join our Zoom Bible study. Unlike the first church, you don't have to wait until the traveling preacher comes around again. You can watch us any day of the week at any time. You do the hosting and we will do the teaching. It just might turn into your favorite time of the week. Download our free app available on Google or Apple. The app is the very best way to keep up with all things Pivot Point. We have links to the messages, Zoom Bible study, our brand new children's page, our Facebook, Instagram, Spotify and YouTube channels and more. If it's happening at Pivot Point, it's on the app. Check it out and see how easy it is to keep up with everything happening. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Rumble, and Spotify. You can also find us in the podcast store wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth is the very best advertising there is, so could you also like, share, and comment on our videos and posts. Every like, share, and invite helps us to reach more people for Christ. Please comment on whatever platform you are watching from so we know you are here. Also, please complete our Connect card on our website or app so we can reach out to you. Since we cannot see your faces, this will give us the encouragement that someone is listening. You can also complete the prayer request card on our website or app so we know how to be praying for you. Don't forget to listen to today's worship music playlist. We don't have a music team yet, so we offer this list each week to enhance your worship time. The songs are different each week, so look for the one with the date that matches the message. If you have found this ministry is a benefit to you, please consider supporting us. The easiest way to give is through the Give tab on our website or app. You can also mail a check or money order to us at P.O. Box 806, Brighton, Colorado, 80601. We don't have a building, but online isn't cheap. Please consider becoming a monthly partner so we can reach more people. Every little bit helps. All donations are tax deductible. We need your help. There is too much to do for just the two of us. And if we are to provide more content so that we can reach people for Christ, we need additional hands to help. We need help with our social media, creating and editing videos, uploading content for our children's page, and of course, our music ministry. If you feel called to assist us in one or more of these areas, please reach out to us so we can get you plugged in. Due to the ability of the internet, we don't even have to be in the same city, much less the same room anymore. You can help us from wherever you are. Just let us know by emailing pastor at pastor.ruthking at yahoo.com and we can get you started. Although we are grateful for our online people, we would love to see some of you in person so we are hosting worship in the workshop this summer in our home. Please register at our website or just email pastor at pastor.ruthking at yahoo.com and we will get you our address. Pastries and coffee is included. We look forward to meeting you in person soon. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.